Man, it, it is. It is a place for some people. I, I like being up here. But for How many of you are kind of not too thrilled about being up in front of an audience? Yeah, I think it's most people. That was well done. Well, today I'm going to tell you two stories. Both are about epic journeys. And the reason for telling you those stories is to help you succeed on your own epic journeys across the shifting sands of life and work. I mean, if healthcare is not shifting like the sands of the Sahara, I don't know what is. We've got repeal and replace, repeal now, replace later, skinny repeal. What's next? I'll have a grande no foam repeal latte with chocolate sprinkles. I mean, it's, it's a lot of change and a lot of uncertainty. So I'm going to talk to you about a wonderful way to approach change and really about getting a lot of excitement in your surgery center. Before I start, I want to, um, you've probably noticed we have some cameras. I want to explain the, the reason for the video cameras. Speakers like myself need, need to have like a two minute YouTube video. So really from this time, we'll, we'll have maybe two minutes total that we're going to use. But I understand it's possible if any, some of you might be a bit camera shy. Uh, maybe you're in the witness protection program. <laughs> uh, if you do not want to be in anything like that, uh, please see me or either Brett here or Tom at the back. When we're finished, we have a software that makes sure your image wouldn't show up in any video. So and I don't want you to worry about that, okay? Because I want to protect your privacy. Okay, so I want to begin with a test. Test goes like this. I'm going to play a few simple rhythms on my drum, and I want you to clap them back to me as a group after you hear each rhythm, okay? Hands ready? First rhythm. Good. Next rhythm. Awesome. All right, try this one. We have some Latinos in the room, I think. <laughs> okay, one more. Ready? Thank you very much. Thank you. I just did that for the cheap applause. No, actually, it was a test. Congratulations, you passed. You have rhythm. Everyone has rhythm. It's a type of human intelligence. Well, today, I'm going to talk about narrative intelligence. Like rhythm, we all have narrative intelligence. Everyone knows how to tell a story. But today I'm going to show you how to build your culture and transform, transform your workplace around a story. A story that uh, inspires change and employee passion and helps people feel like they're literally heroes on a quest. And the idea is that if you want to lead epic change, you need an epic story. And so, I'm going to tell you that first epic story right now. The Sahara Desert is the largest desert on Earth. And we are going to start this story in the middle of the world's largest desert. A desert that is approximately the size of the United States. I would like you to imagine that you and your best friend are right here. You are stranded. You have no vehicle, no means of transportation whatsoever. All that you have is a small campfire which you're grateful for, because the sun has just gone down and it's getting cold very quickly. Now, in the last little bit of light that remains in the day, you see way off in the distance someone approaching you. And I should tell you that in the Sahara Desert, when someone approaches, you pay attention. Now, you know by his graceful movements across the sand that this is a nomad, a people known as Tuareg. And you know that underneath those robes, he carries a 10-inch dagger that is designed primarily for piercing human flesh. Nomad walks right up to your little campsite, holds out his hand, actually speaks a bit of French. He says, un peu de sel, s'il vous plaît. A bit of salt, please. And you give him all the salt that you possess. He takes the salt, disappears over the dune. 
You look at your friend. You both are thinking the exact same thing. I hope he does not come back. So, what is your name? Okay. What's your name? Taylor. Taylor. Taylor, what do you think? Do you think that nomad comes back? Yes or no? He's going to come back. How many of you think the nomad comes back? Okay. How many of you think he doesn't come back? Keep your hands up. It wouldn't be much of a story if he didn't come back. <laughs> Taylor, 10 minutes later, it's completely dark. You hear footsteps. You're slightly relieved to see that it's the same nomad. He appears to be alone. And once again, he holds out his hand, and this time he says, un peu de poivre, a bit of pepper. And as you give him your pepper shaker, you notice he's not looking at you. He's going like this. And now you understand what's happening. He doesn't want salt and pepper. He's casing the joint. He's seeing what it is that you have that he can come and help himself to when you are sound asleep. 30 uncomfortable minutes pass. You're starting to cook a little something over your fire. Nothing special. Just a can. And you don't hear or see anything, but all of a sudden you don't feel right. There's just that kind of, you know that sort of sixth sense when a patient tells you they haven't had anything to eat or drink? You can kind of smell coffee on their breath. You know that feeling? You look around. You see the nomad standing just outside the circle of light thrown by your fire. And this time it's different. This time he does not ask for salt. This time he does not ask for pepper. This time, Taylor, he points directly at you and he says, Venez avec moi. Come with me. And he turns and he disappears into the darkness of the desert night. And you're thinking, come with him. What if he's got eight or nine of his tribesmen on the other side of that dune with their knives drawn? What if this is the oldest trick in the Tuareg Book of Ambushes? Think about it. What would you have done? You all basically have the same information that I had many years ago. Let's take a survey. How many of you would indeed have followed that nomad into the darkness? Keep your hands up. Do you think your patients trust their health to such fools? By show of hands, how many of you would get the heck out of there while you still had a chance? Uh-huh. And where would you go? <laughs> By show of hands, how many of you would have Googled Tuareg? Just... <laughs> By show of hands, how many of you would like to know what my best friend and I did? I will tell you. Later. <laughs> oh, I love doing that. Isn't that a great story? I have told that story about a thousand times, literally. I've told that story so many times, I have stories about telling that story. <laughs> I was once hired to speak each day at a three-day conference. So I had to break my story up into three parts. Day one of the conference, I told the first part about crossing the Sahara. Day two, a guy comes up to me totally distressed. He says, Steve, I've got to leave the conference early, and I, I'm going to miss the rest of your story. And there's a question I'm just dying to ask you. I said, what's your question? He said, did you make it? <laughs> I said, yeah, I made it. He said, yeah, that's what I figured. <laughs> Why does that happen? I mean, he's looking right at me. Why does he wonder if I survived crossing the Sahara Desert? And I will tell you why. It's because stories create reality, like when you cry at the movies. How many of you have ever watched a movie that made you cry? Okay, call out, call out the name of a movie that made you cry. Marley, Marley and Me. Oh, that's a bad one. <laughs> Moana, okay. What else made you cry? Beaches. Beaches made you cry. Another one. Terms of Endearment. Over here, another story. Steel Magnolias. So, why does that happen? Why do you cry? I mean, it's just a movie. It's just a story. Stories create reality. When you cry at the movies, it's because of what brain scientists call narrative transportation. You are so completely transported into the story by chemical changes in your brain that it feels like the movie is happening to you, and so you cry. Stories create reality. And that's why when it comes to any kind of change, it must be story driven, whether it's personal or organizational change, because if you don't address the story, nothing's going to really change. 
And this is a super, super important point. And um, I, I see some of you taking notes, which is amazing. And I wanted to tell you real quickly that I put together an ebook after every presentation with all the notes in it, with uh, some bonus material, some links, some slides. So if you feel like we're going too fast, I don't want you to worry. Everything will go into those notes. I want to give you another example of how stories create reality. How many of you remember this tearjerker from the 70s? Come on. And do you remember what the subtitle was? Love means never having to say you're sorry. Are you kidding? <laughs> that is basically the most frequent thing I say to my wife. <laughs> Come on. This should be the real subtitle. <laughs> but this movie is not about love. It's about being in love. It's about being in a love story. When you are in love, you are in a love story. You know, when you're in that honeymoon phase of a relationship, the love story you are in creates your reality. Hey, we've all been there, right? When you're in love, suddenly everything is upbeat and exciting, bright and shiny, even your clothes fit better. <laughs> the story you're in creates your reality and you play your role to perfection. Because you start saying things like, I think I've met my soulmate, even though it's like your fourth soulmate. <laughs> Any of you done that? But here's the thing. It doesn't matter how many times you fall in love. You always play that same role to perfection. Now, we all know that being in love, being in a love story, doesn't last forever. But while it does, it certainly changes your reality. In your experience, how long does that love story lasts. How long is being in love, typically? How long does that last? Just call out a number. <laughs> what was that? What did he say? Okay, give me a number. Five years. Another number. 30 years. What's your name? I'm sorry? Brelli? Corelli. Corelli. 30 years, really and truly? Would you mind sharing with all of us here the, the name of your medication. <laughs> Just checking. That's, no, give it a round of applause. Come on, Corelli. Let me see if I can get there. First marriage was 11. Second marriage was... I think I can get there. Stories create your reality. And there's really two main ways, okay? Stories create reality two ways. You can tell a story, like when you make a movie or give a speech, and you can be in a story like when you are in love or when you go to work. That's right, you are in a story at work. And here's the key. We always play our roles to perfection. So if you want someone to feel differently about their job, you have to give them a new story so that they can have a new role. This is really, really powerful stuff. I'll give you another example. It's kind of like, um, the idea that stories are true even when they're not. People believe stories more than fact. Scenario here. Let's say we brought in a 10 people. Five of them were very, very fervent Donald Trump supporters. Five were very, very anti-Donald Trump. And we gave them a set of facts that everyone agreed upon. Those are facts. And then we said to each group, well, tell us a story that explains those facts. Do you think we'd get different stories? And do you think there's anything any one of those groups could do to get the other group to change their story? No. So here's one of the things we say in narrative intelligence is it's not just that you have a story, your story has you. So stories are hugely powerful and when you're talking about helping people change, you have to, you have to realize that the stories you tell define the story you are in. I'm going to show you the best story to be in in terms of an organization, a surgery center that thrives in change and is nimble and people can try new roles and adopt new regulations. And, and you need to ask yourself, what kind of story do I want to be in? Because there's only six types of stories. You've got romantic stories. That's a love story. You've got comedic stories, funny stories. You've got dramatic stories. How many of you know someone with way too much drama in their lives? How many of you came to this conference to get a break from that person? So a romantic, comedic, dramatic, tragic. That's when bad things happen. Pathetic. That's when nothing happens. 
And an epic story is when you feel like a hero on a quest, thriving in a world of change, fighting battles, making a difference. What kind of story would you like to be in? Because you have control over that, right? You get to choose what that story is. And we always play our roles to perfection. So changing the story transforms your role, even though you still have the same job. Let me give you a, a personal example of being in a story. OK, so most of my life, until just a few years ago, I was in a comedic story. I asked my mom years ago, Mom, at what age did you notice I was funnier than all the other kids? She sent me this picture. <laughs> until recently, I could not take a normal photograph. It always had to be funny. Even government-issued ID, like a driver's license. <laughs> they said, smile. And then they changed the rules, remember? Don't smile. So I didn't. <laughs> and then there's the day I had way too much coffee. I mean, like, way too much. <laughs> well, wait, here's, here's my favorite of all time. <laughs> and so bear in mind, I used that for five years going through airport security. So a few years ago, I changed from a comedic story to an epic story. And I'll tell you a little bit later how that happened. But the point is that you have a say in what it's like. We are always in a story. Do you know you have a part of your brain? They discovered this at the University of Toronto. It's a brain activity called the narrative focus. All it does is take everything that happens to you and turn it into a story. You can't not have a story. And it's so powerful. Here's a business example. This, I just love this story. So these are the um, four largest public accounting firms in the world. And now typically, KPMG is fourth. A few years ago, they thought to themselves, we want to change our culture. We want new results. And they started to tell themselves an epic story. I'm going to show you this really short video about what they did. So let's roll that first video. What do we do at KPMG? We shape history. When President Roosevelt signed World War II's historic Lend-Lease Agreement, he called on KPMG. France and most of Europe had fallen, and Britain was next. Winston Churchill turned to President Roosevelt, who signed the Lend-Lease Act, and Pete Marwick's senior partner, William M. Black, was tapped to execute this arsenal of democracy, which provided $60 billion in life-saving aid and arms to the Allies. What do we do at KPMG? We reunite families. When the Iranian hostage crisis left over 50 U.S. citizens in captivity for 444 days, the U.S. turned to KPMG Pete Marwick at a critical stage in the final resolution. $24 billion in conflicting claims had to be sorted to the satisfaction of bitterly divided sides. KPMG assured that satisfaction, and the hostages came home. What do we do at KPMG? We champion democracy. When a historic election needed the trust of a nation, KPMG South Africa was there. With unclear results, the election threatened civil unrest. The KPMG team worked round the clock to certify the election, ensuring fairness and accuracy. Nelson Mandela became president, and South Africa became a young democracy. We're all here for a purpose. Inspire confidence. Empower change. Isn't that something? And we're talking about accountants, OK? <laughs> What's the stereotype of accountants? They're boring. They're bean counters. They don't care about stories. They care about statistics. But these accountants at KPMG decided to see themselves as heroes shaping history. And their results are pretty epic. They went from fourth to first ranked accounting firm in America in one year. It never happened. They'd never been in first place. They had one of their best financial years ever. And they climbed 17 points on the list of the 100 best companies to work for because they started to tell an epic story about themselves. If accountants can be epic, so can you. I mean, look at what you do. What you do is epic. 
you help people live better lives, you save lives, you make them feel better about themselves, you, it's convenient, it's cheaper, I mean, it's, it's literally epic what you do, but you need to start to frame the story you're telling in this style. Now, um, this is not, KPMG is not the only company that's doing this. Coca-Cola, Nike, IBM, Microsoft, these are just a few of the organizations that have created a position called Chief Storytelling Officer. They understand that narrative intelligence can improve their competitiveness. They're doing it. And this should be part of your role because people, employees, want more than a job. They want to be part of a story. And the best story to be in is an epic story.